firm uh, down at Stanford over the past 30 years, uh, which I will try and summarize in about 30 minutes. Can I be heard well in the back? Okay. Can you hear in the back? Yes. Okay, great. So, I would like just at the beginning uh, to express not only my gratitude to my hosts and to those of you who have come, but also to my colleagues at Stanford for the work I will present. Of course, I can't really uh, acknowledge the more than 100 people who have done such work over the years, but I'll mention those who contributed uh, to work that is very recent or is yet unpublished, which I'll speak about towards the end of my lecture. Uh, and these are my colleagues, uh, Bushnell, Calero, Elman, uh, Gibbons, Guy Thornberry, Shindu, Yali Lorch, uh, Murakami, Myers, Robinson, and Akami, and again I will repeat their names in some cases as we go along. Uh, my own involvement in work along these lines uh, began with the discovery of the nucleosome, which, as most of you know, is the basic unit of coiling DNA in eukaryote chromosomes. I don't have a pointer, so I'm going to come back to the arrow. And you can see here, uh, what is the point? So, from a combination of x-ray and uh, protein chemical studies, I was led to propose in, in 1974 the wrapping of DNA around a set of glucosone protein molecules of glucosone. And I should say, it was immediately apparent that such wrapping of DNA would interfere with many DNA transactions, including transcription. Uh, some years later, Yale Larch and I showed that wrapping promoter DNA in the nucleosome would prevent the initiation of transcription in a cell through system, so in vitro. And then almost immediately after that, Michael Grunstein and colleagues demonstrated a similar inhibitory effect of the nucleosome upon transcription in yeast cells in vivo. And as Grunstein put it best, uh, the nucleosome serves as a general gene repressor. It prevents expression of all the many thousands of genes in eukaryotes, except those whose transcription is brought about by specific positive regulatory mechanisms. And work since that time, done in dozens of laboratories, has been concerned primarily with the discovery of those positive regulatory mechanisms. Uh, just briefly, it was believed very early on that the, thanks. It was believed early on that the relief of repression by this one of transcription of DNA in the histone was due to the removal of the histone proteins from the DNA. The evidence for this came from the discovery of DNA's one hypersensitive sites, which I learned your uh, faculty mentor, Professor Nedeskyle, and others here, as well as Lula uh, and colleagues at Harvard uh, reported in the 1980s. Uh, so from the discovery that regions of promoters active in transcription are especially exposed to the action of DNAs and also chemical reagents, uh, it was believed early on, as I said, that this one's a removed from promoters of DNA active in transcription. Some years later, when antibodies directly against modified chemical histones uh, in the use, and the method of chromatin immunoprecipitation was developed, uh, and a very different conclusion of this wrong. Instead, it came to be believed that histones are not removed from promoters at all, but only modified. Uh, chemically modified, as most of you know, uh, for example, by methylation, acetylation uh, of lysine and lysine amino groups uh, and other residues, especially in the amino terminal tails of the histones that protrude from the central region of the nucleus. 
And on this basis, then, uh, it was uh, generally thought through the course of the 1990s and well, in, well past uh, the turn of the century uh, that histones are not, in fact, removed from promoters of genes active in transcription and thought, as had earlier been thought during DNA some digestion results, but rather that the structure of the histone is altered in consequence of post-translational modification of the histone. And this reorganization of the nucleus structure would explain both accessibility to nucleus digestion and the way in which promoters then became conducive to transcription. Uh, about 10 years ago, my colleagues Boger and Riesenbeck uh, set out to isolate this altered form of the nucleus. Uh, there won't be time to tell you in any detail about the work they did, uh, but only to state the conclusion which was as given on this slide, that neither of the previous ideas was entirely mistaken. Uh, the histones are removed, but they are also still present on the motors of the normal transcription. That uh, the nucleosomes are removed, but rapidly reassemble. Rather than pose or the problem or address uh, the solution in terms of the presence of absence of this Instead, it's more useful to think of gene activation um, as a transformation of promoter chromatin from a static to a dynamic state. In the repressed condition, nucleosomes are essentially fixed in place. In the activated state, nucleosomes are rapidly removed but also reassembled. Uh, in the case of some genes that we have analyzed in this way, uh, there is no apparent loss of histones from promoters, and yet they undergo transcription, and that is because the DNA is made transiently available in a naked state for interaction with the transcription machinery. Now, in our work, we have focused especially on transcription by the enzyme RNA polymerase II, and that is for the reason that is doubtless uh, well known, I'm sure to virtually all of you. Uh, this is the one of the three metabolic <coughs> enzymes responsible for all messenger RNA synthesis. Uh, these are, of course, the production of proteins. Now, as the first step in the pathway of gene expression, polymerase 2 transcription is a focal point of cellular regulation. <coughs> it is an endpoint of a great many signal transduction factors. As probably all of you know, it is the intricate regulation of RNA polymerase 2 transcription that underlies the earliest stages of development of cell differentiation and development. It was for this reason that we and others uh, concentrated attention during the course of the 1970s and 80s on discovery of the components of the RNA polymerase 2 transcription machinery. Uh, the work was initiated by Robert Rader and his colleagues again at Washington University in St. Louis. It was also extended in a very important way by Ronald and Joan Conway, who were then at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation. Uh, and finally, pursued uh, by my colleagues at Stanford, uh, in the case of the work of Rayer and the Conways, uh, the proteins were derived from mammalian sources, and our work at Stanford from these. Uh, that was uh, about the choice at the beginning, but in retrospect, be essential for the solution of both the structure and the regulation of transcription, as you will understand uh, from the rest of what I have to tell you. The work uh, done by the three groups I've mentioned, uh, Ray, the Conways, and my colleagues at Stanford, culminated in the early 1990s in the identification of six proteins essential to transcription. In addition to the RNA polymerase, five so-called general transcription factors that go by the letter names B, D, E, F, and H. Uh, as you probably know, and I will show you in near atomic detail, polymerase alone is capable of unwinding the DNA double helix and of RNA synthesis. But the polymerase by itself is unable to recognize the start sign of the gene, to interact with the promoter, or to initiate the transcription. It is for those essential steps that the general transcription factors are required. And I will explain and show you in some detail towards the end of the lecture 
the way in which the general factors enable the initiation of transcription. Now, <clears throat> Francis Crick is supposed to have said that we want to understand function, study structure. Uh, the challenge in the case of the transcription machinery is the size and the complexity <coughs> of this entire apparatus. Uh, some, at the level that I just explained, uh, nearly 40 proteins assembled in a complex greater than 2 million molecular weight at every promoter prior to every round of transcription. For reasons that I don't have time to explain, uh, we began structural studies in the 1980s uh, concentrating on the polymerase itself. Um, an assembly of a dozen proteins with a mass in excess of half a million dollars. Uh, it is fortunate in retrospect we did not begin with one of the smaller, simple general transcription factors, because as I will show you in one case, and it is true in others in the course of this lecture, had we done so, we would have failed, because in most cases, these molecules only adopt defined protein structures in the complexes that they form. RNA filaments too is the platform upon which the entire polymerase assembles, and the knowledge of the structure of the polymerase is the key to understanding the transcription process. Again, there won't be time to tell you about the more than two decades of work that went into the solution of the preliminary structure, but only uh, state the result and go on to discuss with you the implications. So in the next slide, we will see the structure that was first determined in the year 2000. Uh, and here, uh, each of the different subunits of uh, the enzyme in the structure is in a different color. Uh, the one that is in red here, the lower left, is, as it were, a typical 25,000 molecular weight protein, which gives you a sense of scale of the synthetic structure. Um, now I'm going to rotate it around. Okay. Perhaps it will give you an idea. Yeah. Just so I can put it on the screen. Transcribing complex in 